Hi, I'm Josie Foss. I'm the executive director of the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. I'm joined today by Professor Tom Daniels. Uh, he is the recipient of one of our Progress of Ideas grants. Um, he's also the Crossways Professor at the Weissman School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. So welcome, Tom. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Josie. It's great to be with you here today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background in farmland preservation, and why the research that you did through the grant on the SALC program really drew and resonated with you? Sure. I've been involved in farmland preservation for about 40 years, which pretty much spans my academic career. And I actually hold a PhD in agricultural economics. So it's an issue that that's been, you know, in the forefront of my life for, for many years. And in farmland preservation, uh, I have to say all of us who either practice it um, or do research on it are always looking for innovative things. Uh, I was very fortunate in uh, 1989 to actually work uh, for uh, the Lancaster County Agriculture Preserve Board as the director of that program for nine years until 1998. And um, I learned to recognize the importance of farmland preservation uh, as, a, as a growth management technique as much as uh, a technique to help uh, farmers become uh, more efficient and, and more productive as an uh, really an op, you know an option from simply selling the farm for for development so the the SALC is really a, a, a very interesting program because on the one hand uh, it has uh, a lot of money and, and in land preservation money you know talks quite a loud voice and um, it's funded through um, proceeds from the uh, auctions that the state of California holds to um, auction off uh, allowances for uh, emitters of greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. And this is California's cap and trade program that's been going on since about 2012. And um, so it's it's been a very uh, good funding source for this farmland preservation program. And in turn, uh, the SALC is really trying to preserve farmland in ways that limit sprawl and limit the spread of development. So this would uh, avoid uh, creating um, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. And so they really want to produce more compact development that's you know, more walkable, uh, more likely uh, to be used by transit rather than people driving everywhere. So it's, it's a very innovative uh, program and uh, it was really uh, a lot of fun to uh, look into it in greater detail. Absolutely. Well, reading the results of the research was really intriguing. Um, so for people who aren't as familiar about the ties between agriculture, farmland loss, and um, climate change, could you walk us through a little bit of, of what that, those interconnections look like? Sure. Uh, in the United States, for example, uh, American Farmland Trust is estimated that we're losing about 175 acres an hour, which translates to more than a million acres of agricultural land a year. And that sounds like a lot on the one hand, but on the other, we have 900 million acres of agricultural land in the United States. But most of that land is uh, rangeland in the West or it's pasture land. And only about a third of it is cropland. And where we are losing um, our farmland is often in metropolitan areas where it's the most productive land. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, that's raised some uh, concerns. I wouldn't say this is a threat nationally yet. Um, you know, we still have food on our shelves in the, in the grocery stores, but it certainly um, has affected a lot of local uh, communities and uh, local farm economies. So this has been uh, an effort now uh, to uh, preserve farmland since really about 1974. And um, the tie to climate change is that as the temperatures rise, it causes more stress on crops, more stress on livestock, and it's caused a number of, of natural disasters already, such as the prolonged drought 
in uh, in California, which is really the the source of uh, much of our fruits and vegetables and nuts. And uh, we've had some very bad flooding in the Midwest. They've had a number of you know, hundred year floods within the space of about ten or fifteen years. Uh, so there's some real concerns about you know what the long term impacts of climate change are going to be on our ability to produce food. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I noticed in, you know, in your materials was the importance of the emphasis on farming, the preserved farmland, as opposed to just preserving land. Why is it so critical? Is it food production? Are there other reasons why it's so important that it continue to be in active use? Well, I think that the most important reason is simply that um, keeping that land producing food and fiber uh, helps the overall local agricultural economy. If you uh, take land out of agriculture, what you're in effect doing is you're taking business away from the support, the, excuse me, from the farm support services, the feed, the seed, the machinery dealers, the veterinarians, and then it becomes harder for them to remain profitable. So keeping that preserved farmland, you know, preserve, producing, you know, food and fiber really helps keep, you know, the food processors, the transporters, the the whole system of of agriculture going going well. Um, I'll add another reason that that often uh, isn't recognized, and that is that uh, if we preserved farmland and it wasn't being actively farmed, then local politicians who have raised a lot of money for farmland preservation might say, well, I mean, why are we preserving this land if we're not using it? And also private land trusts that have done a lot of work in preserving farmland would probably have a harder time getting donations from from people and from uh, foundations to do preservation work too. Sure, absolutely. The continuing meaningfulness of these programs does seem to demand that. Um, You touched on it very briefly already, but I was really intrigued by this notion of farmland preservation as a tool for guiding land use decisions. Can you talk a little bit about that just in general? It's such a, I feel like as someone with a planning background, it's not necessarily something that comes immediately to mind, but once you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Well, first, let me talk about what farmland preservation really is. Yes. And that is, um, it's, it's, it's a voluntary process where a landowner uh, is signing a, a contract called a, a deed of easement or a conservation easement in which the landowner is agreeing not to use the land for other uses other than agriculture or open space. So the landowner is saying, okay, I'm not going to put a Walmart on my land. I'm not going to put a bunch of houses on it. And in return for a payment, um, you have an organization that's either a, a private land trust or a government agency, could be at the federal level, state or local, that is saying, okay, we're willing to pay the landowner, you know, not to develop the land. And uh, we too will sign the conservation easement. And what this means is those restrictions on the use of the land run with the land. And most conservation easements are perpetual. They're literally forever in a day. So if the land is sold or passed on to heirs, the restrictions to agriculture remain on the property. The government agencies or land trusts that buy these conservation easements from landowners then take on an obligation to monitor and enforce the terms of the conservation easement. So they visit the farm usually once a year to make sure, you know, the Walmart hasn't been built, for example, and that... um, you know, the landowner is abiding by, you know, what the deed of easement says. So um, how this plays into um, land use planning, I think, is is in a couple of very important ways. And first is you really want to be able to preserve farmland in large contiguous blocks. And if you can do that, then if you've got, say, a few hundred acres that are preserved, then you you're keeping the development at a distance. And it makes it easier for the farmers to get on with the business of farming without having to worry about neighbors complaining about, you know, noise, dust, odors, and that sort of thing. And also, because you've preserved a nice block of, of land, 
then it compels the development to go somewhere else in the future. And ideally, it compels the development to go to places where you already have adequate public services, sewer, water, schools, and in the process, minimize uh, sprawl and, uh, and obviously minimize the loss of farmland in the process. What um, you have to be very careful about with farmland preservation is if you preserve, you know, some land here and some land there, and it's very scattered, then what we've seen is the preserved farmland can really act like a magnet for development because it's providing what we call the equivalent of the ocean view. So people want to buy property, you know, next to a, a preserved farm because they're always going to have this nice view. And yet that often uh, ultimately ends up making it more difficult for the farmer to farm. So I do see farmland preservation as, as a very important and, and very effective uh, growth management tool. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Um, you talked about, you know, the, the process of preserving f farmland involving purchasing the rights to do other things with the land. So what is the advantage of just purchasing the rights versus purchasing the land and holding that sort of in preservation? Yeah, the... The first thing is a matter of cost. Usually the cost of a conservation easement is somewhere between 30% and 70% of the actual fair market price that you would have to pay to actually buy the farm. The second thing is that farmers are in the business of farming and they, they know how to farm. And so um, we have had some cases where some government agencies or some land trusts have actually bought farms, but then they need to find somebody who's actually going to do the farm work. So it's a lot easier really to just buy the development rights from a, a, a farmer and uh, it's cheaper. And, and again, they know how to farm and hopefully uh, make a go of it as a business. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so one of the things that that you spoke about, you know, in the materials you produced based on the research was this phenomenon where preserve, preserve farmland can actually become too expensive to continue to farm. So can you talk about why that would be and, and what can be done in order to prevent that from happening? Yes, this is a, a, a rising concern. Um, what we have seen in some places is that um, Farmers who have preserved their land, um, you know, literally can sell their property to anyone. I mean, they're not restricted that way. And often you will have, um, you know, second home buyers, rural estate buyers say, hey, you know, there's this nice, you know, 50 acre farm that's preserved and let's buy it, you know. And so they will be able to outbid local farmers for that farm. And, um, you know, and, and push up the price of, of, of land in, in the entire area. Um, we saw this, for example, around uh, Seattle. King County had a program of buying development rights back in the 1980s. And then a lot of Microsoft executives said, hey, I'd like to have a preserved farm. And so they, they not only bought a number of these preserved farms, they put up, you know, houses that would be worth, you know, two to three million dollars. And so that really, you know, kind of takes things away from, you know, the commercial agricultural area. Um, the other thing that we have seen, though, also is that uh, we've seen, you know, rising commodity prices, um, rising food prices, and that alone has has pushed up the, the price of agricultural land. Um, what, what some places have tried to do, especially Massachusetts and Vermont, is put a, a clause in the, the deed of conservation called an offer to purchase at agricultural value or what we call the OPAV clause. And this gives um, the holder of the uh, conservation easement, the land trust or the, the government agency, the right to um, step in and buy the property at an agricultural value if the landowner is trying to sell the property. Uh, this hasn't been exercised much, but um, it's thought to be a way of being able to say, okay, we can step in and buy this property, let's say at you know, $4,000, $5,000 an acre, whereas if it were on the open market, it would go for twelve dollars to 15000 
which is beyond what farmers could pay for it. And if we buy the preserve farm, then we can, you know, sell it to, you know, another farmer. Um, so this is, this is, you know, one of the things that's, I, I think you're going to see that more popular uh, going forward because uh, otherwise um, it's going to be hard, especially for younger farmers. Uh, we hear this a lot. It's hard for younger farmers to access land because land prices are so high. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned uh, the two to three million dollar homes, right, on preserved farmland. Um, farmland, though, in order to farm, you do need some structures, right? So building envelopes. Can you talk about what that is in the context of preserved farmland and sort of why it's problematic and how you feel it could be done better? Yes, when um, a conservation easement goes on agricultural land, uh, by and large, the landowner is allowed to put up any agricultural structures. Uh, you know, I personally have seen entire new, you know, dairy barns and milking parlors go up on, on preserved farms. And that's fine because we want them to be, you know, productive and financially successful. The issue of, of building envelopes, uh, though, usually refers to situations where the landowner is retaining some building rights. Um, they're not selling, you know, 100% of their development rights. They're retaining a couple, uh, let's say, a couple building rights to build a couple houses for, it could be uh, farm worker housing, it could be housing for members of the family. And often that is done by generally identifying what is called a building envelope. And it's very important, I think, to be able to very tightly define you know, where and how big that building envelope is. In the past, uh, often that has not been the case that, that building envelopes have been sort of rather large and rather general. And um, sometimes they end up being on you know, good agricultural land, which you, you really don't want to see. So um, you, you, you really want to have, I think, a survey done of where future um, housing uh, could go for a building envelope. And then you put that survey in the deed of conservation easement to say, OK, you know, the landowner reserved, you know, two lots. Here they are. You know, they were reserved, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We know where they are. And now the landowner wants to build the houses. Fine, and then you and then you really don't have a problem. Okay. Yeah. No. That that makes sense. Um, so we've been talking mostly generally about farmland preservation in the U.S. And then obviously the research that you've just conducted is on this particular program in California. You told us a little bit about the basic mechanics of it that it's funded through a cap and trade program in the state. Um, and it sounds from what you've you know reported on the program as if it's working pretty well. So could you maybe walk us through kind of the basic mechanics of the program? And I know that it's maybe under consideration for upscaling to maybe a national level and what that might entail. Well, the the program um, has, has some sort of what I would call basic features of any farmland preservation program. And that is they, uh, they receive applications from uh, from land trusts, from local governments, or from Native American tribes. And the state of California, um, in managing the uh, SALC program, will provide up to 50% of the cost of actually purchasing a conservation easement to preserve a farm or a ranch. Mm -hmm. And that's really very attractive. Um, what they want to see is they I generally want to see a farm where the farmer is also the, the landowner and the farm operator. They want to see, you know, uh, probably a larger rather than a smaller farm. That's usually the case. But they've added a few things in in the SALC program that I that really are quite innovative. One is they do give extra um, weight on applications from areas where uh, it's a low income community or the farmer who's applying is a you know as a relatively low income um, farmer uh, so that's uh you know that's 
that's very special to the, the California program. The other thing is that they also uh, do a calculation of how much uh, you know, carbon would uh, preserving this farm avoid in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, and that's very unique to the SALC program. Uh, they also want to have some kind of determination of, you know, if we didn't preserve this farm, how likely would it be to be developed? And, and that's pretty common. So you put all these, um, you know, these factors together and they end up with a, an overall score. They also give uh, extra weight to a, a project where the land trust or the local government or the Native American tribe has the funding in hand. So they're literally ready to go if they get the, the money from the state. Um, and I think they've, they've ultimately done a pretty good job because uh, you, you really can look at three things. Um, typically, you look at, you know, uh, how much money did they spend? How many acres did they preserve? And they've spent now, uh, they just had a round um, back in December. So now they've spent about $300 uh, million and they've preserved about 170,000 acres, which uh, in terms of the per acre cost is, is under, it's about $1,800 an acre that the state has spent, which is uh, very uh, attractive compared to what some of the prices we see here in the East. And even if you double that to say, well, the state's only paying half, even at $3,600 an acre, that's still very attractive um, as a long-term investment. Um, the, the other thing that I think is important to look at is that, um, again, you want to see to what degree can a program create these large contiguous blocks um, I was able to see some uh, of the maps of, of where these farms have been preserved. And in, in, in every case, they were either next to uh, another preserved farm or they were very close to another preserved farm. So that strategy has worked well. The other thing is they've spread the money around the state. They've preserved farms now in 32 out of the 58 counties in California. So that's... Um, that's always a good way of, you know, engendering uh, political support. <laughs> so you have that many sure. more representatives who say, hey, they're preserving farms and, you know, in my district, it's got to be a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, but there's, there's obviously a lot of just absolutely great farmland in, in California, in the big Central Valley and down around Salinas and in, in Monterey County and, um, up around Sonoma and, and Napa, where they they raise all the grapes for the the good wine, um, so it's it's you know it's our premier agricultural state, so it's it makes a lot of sense to be preserving farmland there. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, if you were advising sort of at the federal level, given your experience on the East Coast and your knowledge of the programs that maybe predate the SALC, but are sort of different models. And this, what would you sort of say? What would you advise to pick and choose and how would they construct it? Well, we, we have a, a federal program right now called the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. And they get funding uh, from the Farm Bill, which Congress passes uh, every five years or so. And Congress has been putting, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, each year, uh, certainly since about 2002. Uh, into farmland preservation. So it, it's been very popular at the at the federal level. But um, we have at the state level, only 29 of our 50 states have farmland preservation programs. And probably only maybe half of those are really, you know, aggressive in, in preserving farmland. Um, we don't see much farmland being preserved in the Midwest, surprisingly. Uh, not much at all in the Great Plains and really not terribly much in the Southeast. It's mainly been, you know, on the West Coast, um, Washington and California. Colorado is really big. Um, a number of the, actually the ranching states, um, Wyoming and Montana have preserved a lot of uh, ranch land. Um, and here in the Mid-Atlantic, where, where we are, 
uh, about 20% of the nation's 700, excuse me, 7 million acres of, of preserved farmland are found. So Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland um, have, have very good farmland preservation programs. So to take this to the national level, you really would need a national cap and trade program to do that. And I think there's a lot of interest uh, from the farm community in, uh, in selling uh, you know, carbon credits. Mm -hmm. uh, so is, is, is that gonna be the way to go or should we you know, buy their development rights and then say, okay, in managing your property, we want you to also be able to sell credits. So that would give them, you know, actually two streams of income rather than just one there, in addition to their farming income. So that hasn't been um, been worked out. But um, I think I think the track record of the SALC program really shows that you could do um, some pretty powerful things if you had uh, a national cap and trade program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, the, and I think finally, the other advantage of the SALC program is that would it would change a little bit of the thinking of, of farmland preservation programs toward, you know, compact development and, and really, you know, avoiding uh, carbon emissions, which is something we really need to do. Yeah, we really do. Yes, we do. Um, so... The Robert Schockenbach Foundation is obviously focused on the ideas of Henry George, and I know that uh, you're very familiar with, with George's ideas. Uh, and one of the things that you very kindly included in your research results was a sort of thoughts about how uh, the SALC program and farmland preservation might uh, combine with George's ideas to influence land use and, and how he might have thought of these programs in terms of their equity and effectiveness. Do you want to speak a little bit to that? Sure. Um, this was really a, a very fun part of the, the research I did uh, because I had done an article many years ago on, on Henry George um, and looking at, you know, the single tax and how that might impact uh, growth management. And on the one hand, um, I, I have no reservations that the single tax is the way to go to encourage more compact and more intelligent and efficient urban development. I think where there is some debate is, okay, what do you do out there in the more rural areas? And, mm -hmm. and what George was very concerned about in, in urban areas, of course, was that the land was held in, in, in relatively few hands. And so basically these landowners had essentially monopoly power and they were able to, you know, extract, you know, pure economic rents. And so all he was trying to do was tax away the pure economic rent with a single tax. And any economist will tell you that that's efficient and there's no distortion in um, resource allocation if you do that. Um, when you get out into the rural areas, though, uh, and especially today, it's not so much of a, of a monopoly landowner, you have really existing landowners. And the question is, how do we, how do we keep them you know, in the agricultural business? And I think George would certainly recognize you know, the challenge of climate change and the challenge of feeding people. I think he would be very supportive of the equity aspect in the SALC because you know George was very concerned about the uneven distribution of wealth, so trying to preserve um, you know more farmland in lower income communities, I think, would be something he would be very much in favor of. The actual uh, buying of of development rights uh, to farmland is literally paying for uh, the unearned increment, uh, which is something that George was not at all supportive of. But what was really interesting that I found in, in Progress and Poverty was um, some discussion that, that George pretty much had with himself um, about this concept of under an increment, because this really came from John Stuart Mill, the great English economist. And Mill said, look, 
If you buy the unearned increment now, yes, you're paying the unearned increment, but you're you're taking away for the state the future unearned increment. So you're sort of you know stopping it at a certain point in time. And George, you know, sort of grumbled about that and and ultimately came down to say, you know, maybe that's just the best we can do. And in in some ways, I think that's where we are here in the United States, because, you know, as a planner, planners tend to try to use regulation to control things. And um, the people in the United States don't seem that all amenable to regulation. Uh, they seem to understand money pretty well, though. And so um, it seems that investing in, in farmland preservation has been uh, in most places, I think, a, a very good investment, good long-term investment for those communities. And, and ultimately, uh, it's going to maintain agricultural economies in, um, in places other than California, so we don't have to rely on California for all our you know, fruits and vegetables and nuts and, and other things. But also, I think it's going to help within California managing their um, not just their their great agricultural uh, land and, and industry, but also uh, if they can get more compact development, uh, hopefully this will lead to more housing development and frankly more affordable housing, which is which is something that California needs to pay much more attention to. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so you've already spoken a little bit about how farmland preservation can affect land use decisions, you know, surrounding the preserved farmland. And in your research report, you talked about how the application of a single tax or taxing, you know, land value and not improvement value might interact with farmland preservation. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because it was an interesting and potentially, you know, promising sort of thought experiment. Yeah, I, I I think an easy way to to look at that is 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 what has been called the inside game and the outside game, whereas the inside game is more the 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 urban and, and suburban areas where you want the development to go. Um, so you don't want to have landowners, you know, just holding vacant land off the market. Um, you want them to be putting it to productive use, especially additional housing or you know, mixed use development, some commercial with residential that's more walkable or easier to service with transit. And then um, in the in the countryside, um, we've done actually two things. One, we already uh, provide property tax breaks for agricultural land to try to encourage that land to stay in agriculture. But um, I think one of the real advantages of buying the development rights, buying the unearned increment, is that you have a legally binding contract that says you can't develop this land. Mm -hmm. And the only way that that land can then be developed would be through some action of eminent domain by a government to say, okay, we want this preserved farm to put a high school on. But it they do that, it has to be for a public use. They can't say, okay, we're going to condemn this farmland and then let somebody build 50 houses on it. You can't, you can't do that. So I think it, it it's, it's providing, on the one hand, I think the single tax in, on the inside game could really provide a lot more certainty um, for, you know, for development and, and, I would like to see it be able to overcome, you know, the NIMBY, uh, not in my backyard, you know, mentality, which is which has really worked against a lot of necessary development in many cases. And on the other hand, recognize that um, we do need to have, you know, some agricultural land to feed us uh, well into the future. I mean, we we just crossed eight billion people in the, in the world, so. The United States provides a lot of food, uh, not just within the United States, but certainly around the world as well. So uh, our farmers are going to be uh, relied upon pretty heavily uh, going forward. Absolutely. So, so Tom, I mean, 
I feel like we've sort of covered the SALC program and this great research that you've done. What are your future research plans? I mean, farmland preservation is close to your heart. Are you going to keep looking at this program, look into other things? Well, there, there are two things that I'm, that I'm working on uh, right now. Um, I have a project uh, looking at um, the development of uh, utility scale solar on agricultural land. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, expand renewable energy literally as fast as we can and, and get to, you know, net zero emissions by 2050. And if we uh, are able to do that, we're probably going to have, you know, uh, 45% of our electricity coming from solar. And um, the way solar panels work, of course, is they're only about 20 to 25% efficient in turning you know, the sunlight into electricity. And the estimates from the Department of Energy are that we're gonna need somewhere around 10 million acres of, uh, to put under solar panels, unless we can <laughs> make more, more efficient solar panels. So um, there's already a lot of utility scale solar. I mean, these are big, uh, projects usually more than 25 acres, generating more than five megawatts. Uh, we're we're seeing them on agricultural land, um, certainly here in the in the east. Uh, Ohio's doing a number of things. California has them, um, and uh, the question is: um, Are we going to be able to develop the solar as quickly as you know we might need to? And there are a lot of local governments that are, you know, not really wild about solar. You know, what's the impact on their aesthetics as much as, you know, the community as a whole. And um, to really ramp up um, renewable energy, we need to expand our transmission lines uh, considerably. And, you know, do you want to have a transmission line running through your community? So there, there are a lot of decisions that are, that are going to have to be made going forward. The, the other thing that um, the research from the SALC really touched off in, in my head is that I, I, and this is an article I'm currently working on, is looking at the, the evolution of the thinking behind farmland preservation uh, over the last 40 years or so. You know, it started out that it was just, oh, we, we just want to stop the development. You know, we just don't want to see the farmland being developed. And now we're, we're at the point where we're saying, well, okay, now it can help us with some growth management. You know, managing the farm in certain ways can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, U.S. agriculture produces about 10% of the nation's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, uh, different ways of funding, again, through the cap and trade program. Uh, so there, there's been a lot of innovation there. And, and, you know, I mentioned the OPAV clause, for example, is another example of this. And, and something that I, I think that SALC will be moving into probably within the next few years is much more urban agriculture. Mm -hmm. Because they're saying, you know, well, you know, why don't we just grow things where people are? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's another you know, aspect of it, too. So um, I think there are a lot of, you know, interesting decisions that are that are being made. Uh, I think it's a, an exciting time to look at uh, what's going on with the nation's farmland. I agree. Yeah, this is really interesting research to read. Um, and I look forward to reading what you do next. So is there anything that I didn't ask you that you feel like I just want to share this about the research or the program or anything? Yeah, I just like to say that you know it, it's 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 really kind of inspiring to see uh, the number of people who have really dedicated uh, their careers to uh, to the farmland preservation uh, effort. We have uh, usually a bunch of us get together every year or two for what we call the farmland preservation roundtable, and uh, many of us are are now with with gray hair and <laughs> and. And getting up there in years, but it's 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 very exciting to see you know another generation coming along that's it's really uh, energized 
about about farmland preservation and and recognizing you know its importance um and it's it's been wonderful also to see the the landowners you know commitment to uh, to agriculture uh in their communities and participate in these in these farmland preservation programs because without them you know nothing would happen so uh, i have to say i'm really i'm really optimistic uh, going forward and it's uh it's great to see, you know, again the innovations that are going on, and um, and to and to study them. Yeah, I was really struck by the sort of multifaceted notion of farmland preservation and influencing land use decisions, and you know, all of that. I honestly hadn't really thought about that myself before, so it was very eye-opening to kind of like, oh, it makes total sense. Um, so yeah, it's very hopeful work. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us and for talking with me today. Um, and the foundation's really honored to have been able to support you in doing this important work. So thank you. Well, Josie, I'm very grateful to you and the foundation for, uh, for that support.